are listening to a podcast created by the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education. Our mission is to help you understand your world better through geography. Why do great cities and metropolitan areas start where they do? And why do they grow far beyond other cities? In this podcast, part one of two parts, we will use St. Paul and Minneapolis, Minnesota, often called the Twin Cities, to look at the notion of site and situation as they influence the start of cities. In part two, we will explore other factors which contribute to the rapid growth of cities such as St. Paul and Minneapolis. This podcast addresses Minnesota Geography Standards 13112, 33381, and 83351. Our presenter is Dr. David Lanegren, Professor of Geography at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, and Director of Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education. I am Fred Kunze, a member of the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education. And now, here's Dr. Lanegren. People who come to the Twin Cities for the first time, or even people who have grown up here, frequently ask the question, just why are there Twin Cities here? What What's the geographical factor that caused this curious form of development? The answer to it is a combination of the effects of the physical landscape, the site, and the situation or how this area was connected to other parts of the country and the parts of the world. So let's begin our discussion by looking at this site diagram. Now this is a very simplified map of the Twin Cities. It shows the Mississippi River coming in from the northeast, sorry, the northwest corner of the map and then making kind of a lazy S as it goes from west to east, and then the Mississippi goes out, so to speak, uh, at the southeast corner of the map. And the cartographer, Roger Prestwich, has shown the major bluff lines here with vertical lines. So you can see the valley of the Minnesota River joining the Mississippi, and then a place in the northeast called Trout Valley another, uh, we call it a tributary valley of the Mississippi. And you can see I've indicated some place names here, Fort Snelling, Mendota, Kaposia, St. Paul, St. Anthony, and Minneapolis, and a few other names are, are on the map. So we want to start here by thinking about what was the, the process of urbanization and how did this set of locational features affect that development process. The first people who we know about who lived here uh, were a band of Dakota that uh, we now call Kaposia in English. This uh, was a band of Dakota speakers under the hereditary chief uh, Little Crow. Several men had that name. And the Dakota lived here in in the Mississippi River Valley near what now is called Pig's Eye Lake. So it's sort of their winter village, and they would leave this area periodically to hunt in different parts of the surroundings. When the traders came, when the French came, um, many of the Native Americans moved closer to the river to take advantage of the trade routes that the French were developing. Before the French arrived, the Native Americans tended to avoid the river because it was dangerous. It was a path for war parties and So it wasn't perceived of as a major transportation artery. Well, I'm not going to talk about the complicated relationships between the French and the English and the American and the Ojibwe and the Dakota. Suffice it to say that the Americans took control of the land after the revolution and finalized their control of the land after the War of 1812-1814. And they decided that the fur trade business, which had previously gone east along the trade routes on the Great Lakes should be shifted and the fur trade business should go south along the Mississippi to St. Louis and and American cities. So in order to do this, they sent up a military expedition under Zebulon Pike, and Zebulon Pike bought some territory from the Dakota. He bought the confluence of the Mississippi and Minnesota marked on this map with Fort Snelling. 
Later, an expedition of soldiers came up the river and built what we now call Fort Snelling to establish U.S. control of the area. This is a great place for a fort on a bluff commanding both rivers, so the whole thing could be controlled by cannon shots from the fort. The fort was not built to defend the Americans against the Dakota, but rather to defend the Americans against the British. But you can't have fur trade through a fort, so fur traders came up, principally Sibley, and they established the little town of Mendota across the river from Fort Snelling and under the protection of the fort. So Mendota was the first of the, what we can think of, the first of the city settlements here. The fort really wasn't a complete city, and the uh, Dakota were not really urbanized. They had a, a temporary city there. Well, that worked pretty well for a while until uh, the steamboats were invented and until the land east of the Mississippi was cleared of Indian title. Americans treated native populations as sovereign states and American citizens could not own land controlled by the native population. It first had to be sold to the U.S. government and then it could be sold to Americans. So the U.S. government developed some treaties and and so-called cleared the Indian title of the land east of the Mississippi. That happened almost coincidentally with the development of steamboats. When that happened, Mendota was on the wrong side of the river, and so the traders moved downstream to St. Paul, which initially was called Pig's Eye, as many of you know, and it became the port for the area. Now, the site was selected because you you can see it's at the junction of Trout Valley, now called Phelan Creek, and the Mississippi, a large, very large tributary valley cut by an earlier version of the Mississippi. So you could pull up the steamboat to the shore there and use that valley and the other tributary valleys to get from the, the, the floor of the Mississippi Valley to the bluff land and head west. Now, why did you want to go west? Because that's where the falls were, the falls of St. Anthony, which had been known to Europeans since the 17th century, but not really uh, usable because of the land ownership patterns that existed before the treaties were established. So we have the port developing at St. Paul and the fur trade that came down the trails, the ox cart trails, and down the rivers uh, went to St. Paul and the furs and other shipping passed through the city and made St. Paul the first big city in the area. And because it was the first big city in the area, it became the territorial capital and eventually the state capital. But the real industrial base of the region was over at St. Anthony at the falls. And at first... The town of St. Anthony was platted, again, on the east bank of the Mississippi. Uh, Mills set up there to mill the local grain. Uh, But the the primary function there was saw milling because the trees were cut on the headwaters, or not the headwaters, but the upper reaches of the Mississippi floated down, sawed there at St. Anthony, and then the sawn lumber sent downriver to build the houses and towns of the prairies. Eventually, the land west of the Mississippi was cleared, and the little village of Minneapolis was established on the west bank. This was good because the great hinterland of the Twin Cities was to the west in the Red River Valley, where the rich soil produced bonanza crops of wheat, and Minneapolis eventually merged with St. Anthony, and that became the a milling center, and also, interestingly, the first bridge point over the Mississippi. So at St. Anthony, Minneapolis, we have the falls and the ford, the crossing point that enabled people to get from the port of St. Paul out onto the prairies to harvest the tremendous agricultural bounty. So the reason there's two cities here rather than one is the two major urban functions, the port and the industrial base, were separated by 10 miles. So they were too far apart to be one city. Now, of course, they are too close together to be two cities. But we keep talking as if there really are two cities here, when in fact there are only 
one city, one integrated city called the Twin Cities. Now, some people say that the people in St. Paul are the biggest and most successful liars in the world because they have convinced people to think that there are twin cities when, in fact, these two cities have not been the same size since 1870. Finally, we have a new development going on, a new port, the airport established coincidentally next to the old fort, next to the first point of urbanization, and all kinds of economic activity is congregated around the airport and the suburban freeways that serve the city and the booming suburban zone. So that's why we have a place called the Twin Cities, even though it's really only one. You have been listening to a production of the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education. Background music is courtesy of Jim Hogue of Decorah, Iowa. The Minnesota Alliance is a nonprofit group of educators and other parties who are interested in promoting an enhanced understanding of our world through improved geographic literacy.